We work six days and rest one. This is the order of things. We work six days and rest one. It's right from the beginning. We work six days and rest one. I mean, it's literally the opening chapter to our holy scriptures. Numero uno, chapter one. In the beginning, we work six days and rest one. And I'll be honest with you. I'm really terrible at this. It's very easy for me to get into an over-functioning work mindset. I can easily run 60, 70 hour work weeks. I don't think any one of you are putting pressure on me to do that. I don't ever get hassled by committees or individuals to do more or to do it differently. This really just comes from me, my internal rhythm, my understanding of what I think the job needs and how I need to spend my time doing it. If I'm not careful, I forget the importance of maintaining a Sabbath. A true Sabbath is a holy, dedicated time of rest and play. And we all need it. I mean, have you ever had so many things open on your computer that the whole thing just begins to lag? In reality, it's working as hard as it ever has behind the scenes because there's just too many things open in the background. And what you're seeing on the screen is a slogging attempt at loading what's right in front of you. That's what a life without Sabbath looks like. You can run faster than you ever have, but what's out front hitting the world is something that feels like quicksand, slow, worn out, slogging. You know how to fix your computer when this happens, right? Or literally anything in the world that's over-functioning, you shut it down, power it off, unplug it, let it rest. We're no different. So I want you to know, even though my soul is connected to God and maybe stronger than it ever has, honestly, my life feels very ordered right now, but I still fall prey to disorder. And what I need is to give myself permission to experience the holy rhythm of rest to reorder. We work six days and rest one. This is the order of things. We work six days and rest one. It's right from the beginning. We work six days and rest one. I mean, it is literally the opening chapter to our holy scriptures. Chapter one, in the beginning, we work six days and rest one. But I don't always do this. I can easily work seven days and rest none. And I'm wondering, have you lost sight of this order too? This is a good time to invite you into the larger conversation of our new sermon series, which is titled Order, Disorder, Reorder. Things exist in a natural order until complexity and time and pressure enter the fray. Inevitably, things break down, change, die, harden, or loosen, whether we want them to or not. This loosening disorders the original design. It forces creative tension, thus making disorder inevitable. Summer gives way to fall, which gives way to winter, which gives way to spring, order, disorder, reorder. There's always a change in leadership. There's always new competitors emerging or a new software that's released or new protocols or new health codes or new educational standards. There's always a graduation and the like. Order always gives way to disorder. Well, the same is true for our faith. And that's not a bad thing. Disorder is not evil. Please hear that. It's unavoidable. You will be disordered. You can't not be. Disorder is the necessary death that occurs and keeps occurring throughout our lives. This is actually the way of true transformation and wisdom, by the way. We enter into disorder, but we don't stay there. As C.S. Lewis puts it, nothing resurrects without dying first. In other words, there's no real path to eternal life, salvation, reconciliation without going through the dark nights of disorder. But we need to make sure we know that disorder is not the end goal either. True wisdom calls for us to eventually reorder out of it. 
And this pattern is so universal that it's also found in the overarching narrative of Scripture. And that's what we're going to explore in this sermon series together. And it starts with order. There's a rhythm to this world that existed from the beginning. I mean, Genesis says, in the beginning. And then it describes it beautifully. I mean, this rhythm helps create a healthy order. God works six days and rests one. We are to work six days and rest one. This order matters. So why don't we take it more seriously? Dr. Brene Brown says that we should. In her book, The Gift of Imperfections, she has a chapter on cultivating rest and play. And she argues to live a wholehearted life. Rest and play are not suggestions. They're not a fool's hope. They're absolutely necessary to the health and well-being of your physical body, as well as to your mind and your spirit. We will never fully be the person God made us to be otherwise. We'll be a shell of ourselves because we're disordered. I really hope you have an active way of engaging rest. I hope you have moments where you shut it all down, reboot, turn off the mind or the laptop or the thinking or the worrying or the working because you only get one chance at living this day one chance at participating and attending to that thing or spending time with that person or that grandson or that child, you get today. Don't miss your opportunity to be fully present because you're too tired at work or because you're disordered your priorities. Now, I am preaching to the choir here. I know I am promised today, not tomorrow. I know what I'm describing sounds lighthearted and easy. But I also can admit it's anything but. We're people who are addicted to work, to the future. We can't turn it off. We're addicted to succeeding or driving or influencing. We're, addicting, we're addicted to doing more and building more and being more. I mean, more is more, right? We're addicted to outrunning our shame or not feeling alone or winning at all costs. So we grind and we work and we strive and we achieve. But for what? In his book, Infinite Game, leadership guru and honestly one of my favorite authors, I love him, Simon Sinek, he describes the difference between an infinite game and a finite game. Now I won't ruin the book for you, but you can Google his intro videos and you can learn as much as what I'm about to tell you. We are finite creatures. We have a beginning and we have an end. When we play games like baseball or phase 10, they too are finite games. There's a beginning and there's an end. So we learn the rules and we play the game as well as we can in, in order to win. The goal of a finite game is most often to win. In golf, you play 18 holes and the one with the fewest swings at the end wins. There's a hole one and a hole 18. It's finite. But there's also infinite games in which there is no ending. And therefore, there's no real winning. You just play. Life is an infinite game. Now, you're finite, but life isn't. It will outlast you. And so, what are you striving for? Your business is infinite, by the way. It will outlast you. Someone else will step in and do the job that you're doing one day. And the speed in which we are replaced, it can feel debilitating. Companies move on almost seamlessly because the company is infinite. We're finite. And when you're in the infinite game, your mindset has to be different. Your mindset can't always be about winning. I mean, what are you winning if there's nothing to win? What are you striving and working towards when there's no end in sight and no chance at measured success? So when dealing in the infinite, the metric has to change. Your approach to the game has to change. So what does success look like when there's no winning and the game is infinite? Who do you need to be in the midst of that reality? 
I'll tell you. You need to be conscious enough, self-aware enough to know when you're wearing yourself out. And you need to be someone who accepts and practices the beautiful gift and command of Sabbath. Even the God of the universe, in God's infinite wisdom and life, understood the need to sit back and rest. I mean, look at chapter 2 in Genesis. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all their multitude. And on the seventh day, God finished the work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, because on it, God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. God works six days and rests one. We work six days and rest one. This is the order of things. We work six days and rest one. It's right from the beginning. We work six days and rest one. It is literally the opening chapter to our holy scriptures. In the beginning, God works six days and rests one. We should too. You know, embedded into the beginning of scripture is this universal rhythm of order. Now, I could preach for six months on the power of what happens in these first six days, but the angle for us today is to think heavily about the necessity for God to include day seven. The creation story absolutely does not need day seven. The world was created perfectly. It exploded onto the scene from the Big Bang, and God majestically builds containers to hold space and earth and thus planets and stars. Vegetation was a work of art. Humans, both female and male, are made in God's own likeness. The creation story absolutely does not need day seven. I mean, think about it. Day seven doesn't add anything to the created order of things. It's not needed for creation to exist other than it establishes the true order of things. It unveils the wisdom pattern for life that we must learn to rest. So here's the big question. Have you learned this yet? Do you maintain a balance of rest and play? If no, you're suffering for it. When I shut it all down, when I disengage, guess what I've noticed? The world doesn't fall apart. Things were right where I left them when I returned. My mind is also usually clearer. My soul, lighter. I'm less anxious, more present, more willing to laugh and tell a story. We all need to unplug. And not just once. We need it regularly. It is a rhythm. We work six days and rest one. Now that doesn't mean it has to always be on Saturday or Sunday either. Not everyone has the luxury of getting the weekends off of work or school or from caring for a family member. So don't shame yourself for how you're doing Sabbath. Don't shame yourself for not having weekends free. But if it helps, The Pharisees tried to shame the disciples about working on the Sabbath, and Jesus responded to that. Well, you know, humans weren't made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for us. In other words, be careful not to let Sabbath become an idol or a weapon that you wield. Sabbath is a gift from God and a reminder that it's necessary to rest and play. So if you're like me, and have gone too far too long by sidestepping holy rest, by adding more things into your life, even if it's life-giving, well, you're doing it wrong, and it's causing disorder. This week, I implore you, rest, play, do something that turns it all off. Do something that allows you to be present before the Lord. Do something that makes you feel like a kid again. Laugh. Be silly. Dance to a good song. If you have the ability, spend time with your family. Or go find yourself in nature. 
Allow yourself the gift that God has been trying to give the world since day seven. Rest. And if you do this, I bet you'll say by the end of the day, wow, this was very good.